the next talk and then there's another one and then we go for lunch. So, Agile should be about small teams, fast feedback, and don't scale. But we already are more than 20,000 people in the organization, and we still need to be agile. And how can we spark engagement in our product engineering organization where we have more than 5,000 people? And while we are a company, how would any of this maybe apply to an open source community and project? More than you might think. There are many parallels between agile methodologies and uh, open source development. We have rapid feedback, uh, rapid iterations, and collaboration. So I am Jim Kruller, and I work as a principal agile practitioner at Red Hat. And uh, this is how we went about to co-create our new vision for the future. So we don't need to have corporate goals. Yes, there are those two, but what we need is a vision that people adhere to. Something to feel passionate about. Not some corporate platitudes formed by a small group of top management that is here, sort of. No, it needs to be inspiring, and I need to feel passionate about it. And uh, I need to know why we are going on this path. And strategic decisions need to be made, sure, but the way we have worked before is not working anymore. And passion is another thing that Agile and open source have in common. We engage in open source projects not because we are told or paid. Get paid would be nice though, and some of us are lucky to be combining that, but otherwise we do it because we're passionate about something. And most of the contributors they do this in their own time, so you need to be passionate. But why else would you sacrifice all your valuable time to do this? And in open source projects, we most likely rally around some kind of shared vision or common purpose. In a company, yeah, that could vary. And culture, which is important in our company, it's not built or mandated. And in the, in the words of Dave Snowden, culture is an emergent property of interactions over time. And we need to change those interactions. But change is hard. Everybody has a lot to do, and then we hope that they will have the time and, and energy to make an other change as well. It's often as much of a culture and mindset shift than rather a mecha mechanism shift. But a team might not be prepared for it. A team might not want to go this way. And if your team or community is volunteers, there's no way you could or would try to force them. So what we need is direction. And then take small steps in that direction every day. And I need to be able to keep this up no matter if it's uphill or downhill. So it needs to be inspirational. I need to feel part of the journey. I need to feel I was part of deciding why we went on this journey in the first place. If I had to just keep it up when things get tough. And they will. They already are. And in open source, we don't build for a year and then release with a big bag. No. It's small steps towards that vision every day. And if the community is going in every other direction, the project might be scattered and somewhat confusing. But if we all more or less go in the same direction, we build something together. And do one thing and give it well. It's a rephrase of Dr. McKinroy on Unix philosophy. But back to our problem at hand. As many other companies, we face the same market pressure, increased competition, increased demands. We do have agile teams with good performance in many places, but we could need more. And our vice president of product engineering expressed that he would want an engineer to start working in the morning and easily know what would be the most important thing to work on right now. And also to be able to track how this task ties into team goals, product goals, and even back up to the company strategy. 
And at the same time, then we want the opportunity for top management to be able to look from a strategy perspective and then drill down to task level if they would like to. Total transparency. And without putting more pressure on the people actually doing the work. So, under the open decision framework. What is that? Well, it's a flexible open approach to making decisions. You might not want to use it for every decision, as that would rather make it more complicated than, than supporting, but for decisions that impact the people in the organization or community, or our culture is a really good fit. We started out in the Red Hat people team and the cross-functional focus group together with Matteo and Rock from Duke University, Diana Martin and Community Resources. The purpose was to come up with a way to better align business decisions with the people to help preserve our culture. Giving a framework to demonstrate what good looks like and offer guidance both to keep it going and also for new people joining the company as Red Hat crew. There was, and still is, a long tradition of discussions in our internal mailing list, which is an open mailing list where we discuss everything. And this was a way, well, this was to be a way to guide a more structured discussion when needed. From there, was picked up by the Project Management Office in their effort to create an open project management me methodology. That's one of the hardest words I know. It spread to IT and engineering when there was a suggested move to Google Calendar, which, as you might guess, spun out a long discussion on the internal memories. Using the open decision framework would support and guide those discussions and land a more open decision. And being an open source company, it was a natural step for us to then publish the framework to the community and hope it might be useful to someone else. And within Red Hat, we have an own culture of open source principles. We have open emails, open debates, such as the famous and influence in memories just mentioned. We share information to be transparent and to get more and better feedback. This translates into open decisions. Be transparent. People need to know the problem exists to start out with, who is making the decision, the requirements, constraints, and the process, especially on how to contribute. And it needs to be inclusive, and people need to have a say in it, especially those that will be impacted by the change or the decision. And make sure to seek out diverse perspectives. And why is that customer-centric? Think of the people as customers with competing needs and priorities. These are internal stakeholders, or other departments, or your community. So it's not selling customers in this sense. And we use open source principles to make open decisions. And this includes open exchange. When you're developing software and trying to solve a business problem, open exchange begins when you share your source code. A free exchange of ideas is critical to creating an environment where people are allowed to learn and experiment and use existing information to create new ideas. And in participation, we are free to collaborate. We create, we solve problems that maybe no one person is able to solve on their own. Those that are most impacted by the change, as I said, can help influence it. They can help course correct or identify misconceptions or data gaps. As with our development, we want to release early and often to get crucial feedback. Rapid prototypes can lead to rapid failures, which can lead to rapid learning and better solutions faster. We are free to experiment. You can look at problems in new ways and look for answers in new places. And you learn by doing. And as I mentioned, communities are formed around a common purpose. They bring together diverse ideas and share work. Together, a global community can create beyond the capabilities of only one person. It multiplies effort and shares the work. And together we can do more. Like the old proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. 
And forming communities automatically also builds trust in what the decision process is, irrespective of what the actual decision outcome is. And we mean that open source principles lead to better decisions, and open decisions lead to better outcomes. And the outcomes also lead, as I mentioned, to buy into the decision. Open decisions take longer time because there's a lot of communication. And it takes more time than just having one person decide, but we can prepare for a much faster and easier adoption. It makes whatever comes next easier and faster. In this whole community, we are seeing where the BDFL, benevolent dictator for life, decides something the community don't agree with. Then, the community forms the project and they leave. So, try to avoid that. If you do an open decision, the outcome can be implemented, realized, and enacted much quicker. And what we love about this approach is that the best ideas evolve. You're not going in with a predetermined idea. You might have a rough direction, but you're also open to get really far out ideas from someone that no one has thought about because you're not coming from that diverse mindset as a person that makes it. Again, you will never get a perfect decision that 100% of people agree with, but everyone has a chance to feel heard. They get an understanding of why the decision has to be made. You get visibility into the requirements, constraints, research approach, and evaluation criteria. And they can challenge it, and they can discuss it and add to it. So you shouldn't be surprised or run down by such decisions. And we also hope that this understanding will help you to accept the decision and the way forward, even if you don't agree with everything in it. So, to the framework, there are four phases, which doesn't mean they're necessarily linear. But concept defined idea, this is where you want to define what the problem statement is in a very clear and concise language. It will help us solve the right problem and keep us focused. We need to be careful about the scope, as maybe not all parts of the decision can be open. There are constraints, for example, that could be a financial constraint, so as part of this decision I'm talking about, we couldn't hire 50 people to come in and solve the problem for us. So we scope that and say that we need to use the people we do have available. And the constraint may also include viable approaches. There could be regulatory reasons why we have to do parts of it in a certain way. The second part is to uh, identify who can contribute and who also takes the final responsibility. It could be the CFO to release the funds for it, or the CEO to set the strategic uh, direction. But it clearly articulated and clearly bounded, and it means that if something needs to be rejected, it can be explained, and that also creates that transparent way forward. Next is where we do our research, engage with the organization, and we use qualitative and quantitative data gathering to try and pull in as much information as we can. The key part of this is to lower the barriers for participation. Don't set up a call at 9 o'clock Central European time if you have a global organization and some people that should have joined is or are actually sleeping. As an open source community, you could have other challenges, such as language barriers. How can we make it easy for non-native English speakers to participate and make their voices heard? When we set up this working group, we make sure we have a diverse team with global participation. And even though our corporate team is English, there were many times when some of us non-native speakers had to speak up and address phrases or words that was used that was assumed to mean something but didn't make sense to me as a sweep. Or it could be interpreted in different ways. And in one community where I was at before was the youngest contributor was 15 and the oldest were over 60. And the generation gap in how we communicate is real and it needs to be addressed. Also be specific about the type of feedback we are looking for and consider peer-to-peer -peer feedback as well as any form of channels. 
and then plan the transition. Gather the feedback and think through how you could respond to people who might be upset with the direction. Coming up with the former phase into design, development, test, we have formed our hypothesis, we have formed potential decisions, and we now build a community map. Make sure people have the opportunity to get their feedback into the right mechanisms. And not just that, evaluate it and acknowledge it. Thank you for your feedback. We you really appreciate your input. That means a lot to people. To say that they were heard, and as part of that we explain why your suggestion wasn't feasible, or if we take your suggestion on board, we highlight the change and credit that person. And that way you are showing the incremental evolution of the decision. And finally, launch. Demonstrate the alignment with strategy, culture, mission and values. Show how to <coughs> back shape the decision and explain how to provide input after launch. Acknowledge gaps and concerns with human. There are going to be gaps. There are going to be fears and concerns. And we might discover something along the way. And we have to acknowledge that and maybe have a follow-up problem or even a separate OEF process. And these four, these four phases, they are feedback loops. It's not a strict waterfall approach. We might need to go back to early phases when we discover something new. And the way we have worked, I'm going to time box the phases to keep momentum going. So how about that vision then? In September 22, there was a call for volunteers, and there had to be a selection. And the selection criteria for 22 people made sure we have a good mix of diversity and creativity, as well as representatives from the different product areas and experience with Agile and B. So then we would have a diverse team driving this. Although it could be argued that the 20-hour time commitment would exclude some people, but they would get their chance to contribute at later stages and with the time they do have available. There was also a requirement to be able to travel to the in-person kickoff, which sadly excluded a couple of the initial However, this team was only driving the decision, we're not making the decision. Their role was to engage and engage the organization and talk to uh, colleagues and bring those colleagues into the conversation. But wait, you only got 100 volunteers out of 5,000 people? That is only 2%. And we only have about 50 people in our community, so that could potentially leave us with only one, one volunteer. Yes. But your circumstances might differ. Also, being a not gigantic community, perhaps you can make similar inclusive decisions without the support of a framework. There's probably a sweet spot somewhere where it makes sense to utilize the ODF and when not. I don't have that specific number. And as I mentioned, we're already seeing indications of fallout from burnout, so we're putting people very centric to our problem and upcoming solutions. So we have sustainable balance. So in November of that year, we managed to get together in person for three days outside of Boston to nail down phase one. We iterate on the problem statement, which, among other things, changed the original objective from an agile vision to a continuous improvement vision. What the objectives were, which is expanded to four objectives, but also to some things out of scope. We talked about what the constraints were, such as using the people that we didn't have in an organization, and that the tool for the single view of our products would be Jira. This probably caused the most discussion, but it was mandated long before this ODF even started. So it was more of a clarification that the ODF was not going to get into the tool discussion. And yet, we still have that discussion today. And last but not least, to explore the problem space and prepare ourselves for the coming phases, which would have to be done remotely. We self-organized into three working groups, one for three of the key objectives, and then everybody pitch in for the overarching vision. And over the three days we worked intensely, both in breakout groups, but also in the entire group. And we used techniques such as the one, two, four, all method, but also to icebreaker exercises throughout the three days to get to know each other in a very short amount of time. Not all communities and companies have the opportunity to meet face to face and we make use whatever communication tools you have available. Then we embarked on a journey of feedback. 
We got open feedback that were calls, open forums, we use shared documents as a collaborative mechanism where we publish our research and our hypothesis and we ask people to bring their feedback. The statistics here is only from uh, one version of the different documents in our four objectives. And as we can see, it ramps up, gathering interest, then ramps down again as people start to be happy about the content. And not all comments and replies made it into the final version. There was great conversations and it was very hard to trim down the vision to five values and 13 principles. And we used an um, internal portal for this decision discussions and the Google Suite because that is what we use in our company. Other companies have other tools and the community has their preferred tools like IOC, Macrolos, mailing lists, or forums like Discourse and GitHub discussions. We also facilitated open forums such as office hours twice a week to accommodate for the time zone differences, we engage in one on ones. There's no bad feedback, but feedback that might need to be peeled apart. This is coming from a personal opinion or a strategic opinion. So see the reason behind it. We went into team calls and leadership calls and encouraged them to contribute to the documents. And that showed that we got everyone from the intern to the vice president of product engineering participating and collaborating, which led us to the set of outcomes that we are now calling version 1.0. What would such events and forums look like in a community? <laughs> and then we launched in February 23. What happens next was a continuous work of spinning up a new team in a hub and spoke model that are committed to growing and evolving the next steps. They might run more on the X in a more targeted manner, or the documents that we have will become a basis for the next set of strategic decisions, objectives, and actions. So a quick look at what happened since. The hub and spoke model includes the Agile Leadership Team, the ALT in the middle, formed as a team with seven spoke leads, one for each product area in product engineering, a product owner, and a transformation agent. And while the ALT and the hub review practices and goals from a large perspe perspective with a strategy and roadmap, each spoke is then semi autonomous in developing their own spoke specific strategy. Each spoke is made up of several departments and organizations, those of them made up of several teams. And the hub below supports the ALT and the spoke with focus expertise such as agri practitioners, product managers, program managers and product experience and team. And certain method methodologies and materials are centrally available, such as the continuous improvement framework and training and enablement for common training. The hub and spoke model is a common way to try and scale while maintaining some kind of autonomy in each spoke department and team. It does have its drawbacks. So they're keeping the ALT from becoming political and still being effective, and keeping the autonomy of the spokes and teams, but still within some guardrails, as we still need to function as a large organization. And personally, I think some things are not really up to the individual teams, but some of need to be agreed upon from a center. At the same time, we don't want to be too prescriptive or mandate a certain way of working. So it's a balance. And then my personal reflection on our approach of gathering all the feedback is that we didn't get this balance right between making it easy for everyone to contribute and still being able to facilitate and aggregate all the discussions and feedback. We have the portal, Open Decision Hub, where we host our open decisions and documents which acts as a discussion forum. However, as we discussed, and not everyone agreed, we opened up the feedback and discussion directly in the various Google Docs. Already there, we got duplicate discussions and questions. And then when we add in all the other communication channels, well, it turned out to be a lot. Maybe it would be a better strategy to use all channels of communication, but only one for action feedback. We tried to steer that, say, great conversation. Would you mind adding a topic to the open decision hub? Which some did, but probably not all. The hope was to lower the barriers and make it as easy as possible for everyone to contribute in the format that suits them best, and try to minimize the viewers only group, to include them and know whether they agreed or disagreed or had some ideas that had not come up yet. But it put a lot of pressure on the working group to facilitate. 
So we're not standing in scale rights, but we get engagement from all over the organization. And we have a vision in supporting things. And the AT has continued to work in the whole spoke model, and we're now kind of in the middle of it all. I hope you found some inspiration and possibilities in the open decision framework. Because it started out as an entire project and then became public, I mean it's a bit structured that way. So I encourage you to test it out. What works for you, what doesn't, bring, bring your feedback and experience to get the wider community and uh, see what could be changed and improved. And together we can make this better. And with a couple of minutes for feedback, I'm all about feedback. But Give a similar talk later this year, and therefore, if you would like to, I'd be very happy to scan this one and uh, give you some feedback what to improve as well. But, sorry, no, we didn't have time for that. But anyways, and thank you very much. And if you want to reach out, there's some information where you can reach me, and there's also a LinkedIn QR code. And uh, short <coughs> shout out to Hello Facts, who had excellent customers, so I'm making sure I got this fabulous Fedora hoodie in time.